to say that I... <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I want to say that I certainly love this fellow, too. Brother Joseph has been my friend for years. I would like to have the opportunity sometime to tell you how we ever come together. But I, I just trust that the Lord loves me like Joseph does, and I'll be all right. <laughs> God bless you, Brother Joseph. You. Lord bless you. I believe we were going to sing that, Now I Believe. And let's mean it from our hearts tonight. Now I Believe. just a moment while we remain standing, and in this moment let's bow our hearts also to him. Now I wonder if there's any in the congregation would like to be remembered in this prayer, just by raising your hand to God, saying, God, this signifies I have a need yet, and I'm wanting you to supply it. God, grant your request. Our Heavenly Father, the great and almighty Jehovah, who formed the earth out of your word, and has given us the opportunity to sojourn here and make our decision whether we want to live or die. Choose you this day, and we choose between uh, death and life. So I pray, Father, if there be some in here that does not know Thee as their own beloved Savior, that this night they will choose you, which is life to know. And then if there's those here tonight that sick unto physical death, that they will choose you tonight as their healer. And it will also mean physical uh, restoration again. Oh, thou art so good to the sons of man, long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. You send forth the clouds for the rain and bring forth fruit and food up on the earth to feed your children. And we are so dilatory, Lord, so destructive to waste and to be selfish. And, oh, God, just forgive us, Lord. We, we plead for mercy. We would not want your justice or your judgment. We want your mercy, Lord. So we pray that we may be partakers of your mercy. Father, not that this congregation hear me, but that you might, standing here in this place, has been dedicated. I thank thee for this fine fellowship, and I believe with my heart that if you should come tonight, there would be a host of New York people going that great rapture. And Father, we pray that we will be lights, not under a bushel but under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that lights the candle, that we might be lights to this dying world as the great dismal fogs of unbelief is floating in from every side. We know soon we'll see our Lord break back that fog when the light begins to shine. And we trust, Lord, that you'll make us ready. If there's anything we have need of tonight, supply it to us, Lord, through thy grace. For we ask it in Jesus' name, thy child. Amen. Amen. I am not very expressive, but I'd like to say to Pastor Vic, his little co-worker there, and the choir a bunch of ladies and men 
to all the cooperating pastors, laity, all of you, and the visitors, strangers in our gates, I want to thank you for your support this week of your prayer and cooperation to try to bring the gospel light to this city and our efforts. Pastor Vic, with many other pastors, are that we are saners in this great lake. There's fishes in here that belong to God. We do not know who they are, where they are, but as he stands at one corner, another at another corner, saning, I just come to weave my net with theirs, with the ministry that's giving mine with theirs, to try to reach out and get a, a little larger group in that we might present them to God and say, Father, is there any fish in here? Is there any seeds of life predestinated to be in the book of life that the Lamb died for? If they're there, we feel that when the gospel light strikes, they'll see it right quick because they are predestined to that. Now, we are sorry that we did not have room to accommodate the people. Each night, nearly when I've come up, there's been great throngs of people all up and down the street, walking, trying to get in, and some crying, some different, you know. But uh, know that it's, they have a law here, a fire marshal's law, just so many. You have to leave so much aisles and so forth. And that they cannot help because that we are, as Christians, we've got to do that. For the Bible said, Jesus told us to give Caesar those things that pertain to Caesar, and then to God those things that belong to God. So we try to, and if we will not obey Caesar, it's doubtful that we'd obey God. And as long as, as Caesar's laws doesn't interfere with God's, we must obey God first. And then of these far hazards and so forth, well, they know how to take care of that. And they would, told us, I, I was asking for mercy for the people and seeing them up and down the streets and things and the sick and trying to get in and bring them in cabs from across uh, somewhere else in New York or Long Island and Jersey or different places in Manhattan. Well, you see, but we, we can only ask, and then when I find out that that's the law, uh, he said, if the farm marshal would come in and catch us crowded like that, he'd close the whole meeting. So that would cut everybody out. I want to express my gratefulness to the, the, um, the owner or whatever it might be or the company that owns this building and to the management for letting us have this building and for the uh, custodian and the courtesy of, of giving us right away. They've been very, very nice. And if, they're, if they don't at this time have eternal life, I trust that God will give them eternal life. And now, this may sound like a, a rational statement, but I say this only because of the, I'm zealous for Christ. I do pray that if this building be used at any time from hereafter for dances or worldly entertainment, that the Holy Spirit will throw such conviction up on those people <laughs> until they'll weep. I pray to that because... I'm sure that the people, even that owns it, would rather see souls saved to the kingdom of God than to have the other going on. And now you're welcome back for me to come back. That just fills my heart because little odd ministries is sometimes so unwelcome amongst uh, a brethren, especially some of them at that in their certain organization that they uh, are built up to a place that they cannot accept it. See, because there is a system behind it, not at many of those precious men. I've met Catholic priests that stuck my hand and just looked me in the eye and think I didn't know what was going through his mind. That's discernment. You see what you see here. He wanted to embrace it, but couldn't do it. See, he, He'd be excommunicated. Protestant ministers the same way, fine brethren, and they, uh, they want to do it. That way, when I speak against some denomination or the denominational system, it isn't the people in there. It's the system that I'm against, you see. 
that holds them apart, holds us from receiving. See, they draw up their declaration, say, we believe this, period. If they would end it with a comma, we believe this plus as much as the Lord can show us out of his word, it would be all right. But they do not do it that way. <laughs> you know that. It couldn't be a denomination to do that, see. It would just be the move of God moving on all the time, see. And the, uh, each one becomes a latter rain to the other. See, um, Luther was a latter rain to the Catholic, and John Wesley was a latter rain to Luther. The Pentecostals was a latter rain to the denomination. Now the Pentecostals are organized, now what's going to happen? <laughs> but remember, the children of God never drove their stake tents down or, or so tight, but what they could pull it up, and when the fire moved, the pillar of fire, they moved with it. See? They moved with the pillar of fire. But when you get the pillar of fire doing something, the Holy Spirit doing something, and then after that man with the message departs this life, then they say they organize upon his work, and the pillar of fire moves right out and leaves them sitting there. This goes right on. They're so staked down till they can't move. And I, but in there is many fine-hearted people. I don't know when that I've had any more liberty to speak uh, just my heart than I have right here. Now, they're, they're say that the New York people are cold, different, informal, the great molding pot where they get a handful of the worst out of every nation and dump it in and grind it up, and you got New York. See? But I want you to know in there, some of the saints of God are in there also. See? That's right. It's true. And everywhere I go, around and around the world, I find the saints of God are in every nation, everywhere. And the strange thing is, I might say this to some of you, just drop it in as a missionary. I, I find that I go into a nation that doesn't even know which is right or left hand. They do not know what uh, any words, how to spell anything. Only thing they know is just kill and eat. But let those people receive the Holy Spirit. And they do the same thing you do and act the same way you act, not even knowing one word about it. So you see, it's to all races, all peoples everywhere. And we all have the good and bad. And I do feel tonight and thank our Heavenly Father, for I, I believe that part of the cream of the crop I have the privilege of speaking to tonight. Now, you can imagine the responsibility to speak to a, a group that would lay on to every word you say, and then you'll have to answer for what you told them at the Day of Judgment, because through the little humble ministry, it gives people faith to know that a human being cannot do those things. It has to come from God. Therefore, that they lay on to every word you say. So I never tried to build something, uh, thinking and writing down scriptures and, and notes that it would be something that I thought would make the people all elated. See, I, I try to pray and to think of something that would be constructive to you, that would help you. Because I'm not here just to, for us to uh, clap hands and shout and run up and down the aisles. Well, I believe in that, sure. But there's more than that to it. It's got to have a foundation for this, you see. Um, I believe that when you jump, and when you come back down, then live as high as you jump, you see. And if you don't, don't jump. See? So then just always jump as high as you live. And now that's, that's what we should do because, after all, see, your, your life speaks louder than your testimony. You know, see, people know what you are by the way you live and the things you do. Now, I've been very long at night, supposed to be out here. Well, I guess it's the correct time in the next 20 minutes. And I haven't even started. And I, I'm slow. I, I just, I, I'm always late. I, I, I was late getting here. I was a little over nine months. And then I was, <laughs> right? When I was born, I was a little over time, my mother said. And then when I got it, what education I got, I was always behind. 
When I got married, I had my wife waiting about three hours, so I made a sick call. I was late at my wedding. Now, if I can just be late for my funeral, that's the next thing to see. That's the main thing. I don't say that, but that's the truth. But I'm, I've never tried to educate people into it. I never tried to think, just let the Holy Spirit have its way. I've got two girls at home. I was just talking to them a few moments ago. One of them is... Rebecca, the other one, that's the older, the younger one, sister next to her, is Sarah, and they are about nearly five years apart. Some time ago, I was in a missionary meeting, come home late, and they're daddy's girls. They, even now, Rebecca's a young woman, but she's still daddy's girl. And I love my children, and I remember... Uh, they would set up and wait. I wouldn't come in for months, and then when I come in, they'd wait to see me. Well, they were little. It's been several years ago, about 10 years ago. I'd been overseas. And I was coming in, and the plane was late. And so the little girls got sleepy and went to bed. The sandman got in their eyes, or throw the sand in their eyes, rather. So then, well, wife waited up, and finally I got in early around 3 o'clock in the morning. So then I was so tired and weary, I couldn't sleep. I laid down for about an hour, and I got up, went in the living room, sat down in the chair. And after a while, it broke day. And the first thing you know, I heard a noise back in the room. And as the two girls had, had woke up, and Rebecca woke up first. The idea struck her. Daddy's home. Here she come, out of the bed, and here she come. Well, that woke her little sister up. I, I guess my children's like yours. Uh, when the oldest one wears something almost out, the next one gets the hand-me-down. So Sarah was wearing Becky's pajamas, and that was the times that they had these kind of rabbit feet pajamas, great big feet in them. And they were certainly way too long for, for Sarah. And so she couldn't keep up. Her legs was too short. And so Rebecca ran in and jumped up on my knee and threw both arms around me and began to hug him in. Of course, I had to cry a little. So, and poor little Sarah thought she was left out. Becky had beat her. So she was standing at the door, and her big black eyes looked up and the tears on her cheeks. So Rebecca turns around and said, Sarah, my sister, she acted something like I think some of the churches try to do, you know said, I want you to know that I was here first. <laughs> and she said, and she had both arms around me, and she said, and I've got all of Daddy, and there's none left for you. Now, that's what they try to tell us a lot of times, you know. Well, Becky was kind of long-legged, and so she could reach the floor. She was pretty well established, you know, <laughs> like many of the churches. But... Uh, Little Sarah, she was so hurt until I looked at her. I winked my eye at her, you know, and motioned like that and stuck my other knee out. That's what she was waiting for. Here she come. And she jumped up on my leg and is a little too high for them short legs of hers. And she was wiggling about like she's going to fall. Well, I caught her with both arms. She put her little head up against my bosom and she kind of liked the feeling, I guess, and so did I. So I was hugging her. And she raised up and she looked up at Rebecca. And I thought, this was pretty good. She said, Rebecca, my sister, <laughs> I want to tell you something, too. <laughs> she says, it may be right that you were here first and you got all of Daddy, but I want you to know Daddy's got all of me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a theologian. I didn't have long enough to grow in some school of theology, but I, I hope he's got all of me. <laughs> That's all so he can use me. Last but not least, by no means. I, I never come here and I ask them not to take up any offering. Uh, I, I don't come for that. I've never tuck up one myself in my life. All my, I've been a minister for 33 years. I've never tucked an offering in my life. There's been some taken for me by ministers, but I never tucked one in my life. 
And I, I hope I never have to. But that you have done it, it will go, I will take it and put it into foreign missions and go over myself to bring the people that hasn't the privilege that you have here to bring the same gospel to those who cannot afford to stand for me or pay my way. Therefore, I am thank you. That they too who are underprivileged might have the same privilege that we have here. And not one penny of it will be spent for you know, drinking, smoking, or it, it'll be for the kingdom of God. And I trust that um, God will, in that, uh, give you a great mention, insomuch as you have done unto the least of these my little ones, you have done it unto me. And may the Lord bless you. And now I'm going to try tonight, I want to ask one question. How many was in that great prayer line last night that passed through under the hands of these ministers? that feel the Holy Spirit's already working in your case. Let's see you put your hands up. Oh, that's wonderful. That's just fine. Beautiful. He always does. He works in your behalf. Now, I thought tonight, man, we've had so much healing services, and we've seen the Lord Jesus in his great power, making him the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we have learned through the week that there has been many great signs that he has showed us of his uh, uh, a presence right here with us now in the form of the Holy Spirit. Now, next Sunday, I'm to be at my tabernacle, Sunday morning and Sunday night at, in Indiana. And then the following week, I'm in Shreveport, Louisiana in a big convention. Then after that, I go to Yuma, Arizona, and then back to Phoenix for the Christian businessman, then back to Indiana for the Christmas holiday, then back to Phoenix again. If any of you is around there have friends, uh, beginning on the 19th, they gave me that nice, about 4,000 seating Ramada Auditorium, air-conditioned, free, uh, 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 prior the International Convention of the Christian Businessman, and I speak two nights out of the four, and uh, Mr. Roberts one night, and I think uh, Brother Brown one night. And I think mine's the opening night and the closing night, and then from there on and on. Pray for me. And now I, I need your prayers. If there's anybody needs prayer, it's me, you see. And uh, Satan, sure, I'm a target for him, you know. I have to keep up the faith all the time, that shield, to march on. The Lord ever bless you. And if I never see you no more, until that day, I will meet you in the morning, you see, at that gate. And then in there, I can say as I say now, I'll still be believing this same glorious gospel and believing that Jesus Christ is not dead, but he's alive among his people, and his gospel is the same, and the things that he did, we are to do till he comes. And I realize that God will judge me for those things, and I preach. I, I'm, I have to answer to God for what I say. Now, may the Lord bless you, and just another word of prayer before we open the book. Lord Jesus, take the word now and feed our hungry souls. We are waiting patiently, Lord. We are under great expectations, like at the last day of the feast, how the people rejoiced. We're thinking of Simeon in the temple, promised by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death until he seen the Lord's Christ. And there it was on that great day. When the women come in to have their children circumcised and offer the gift for purification, and it was at that time that the, the Jesus was brought into the temple, and Simeon, maybe off somewhere in a side room that morning in the office, but the Holy Spirit made him the promise. And here was the Messiah in the arms of his mother, the little fella out there wrapped in his swaddling cloth. And Mary, them keeping her distance away from her because she had a, a bad name, so thought the people, the baby was born out of holy wedlock. No one wanted anything to do with that woman. But in her heart, she knew what she held in her arms. And Father, may our heart tonight cradle that same hope. No matter what the world says, we know what has entered our life. 
And at that time, Simeon, the one that said that he, the Holy Spirit told him that he would see the Messiah, yet old, well stricken, an old sage, honorable man, but he believed the word of the Lord to him. The Holy Spirit coming to him and he going led by the Holy Spirit down through the building around this great string of mothers with two and a half million people that time overnight. There might have been as many as several hundred babies born, and there they were standing ready for a circumcision and purification. And how the Holy Ghost led him right to this little rejected person, reaching over, picked him aside in his arms, with tears running down his beard. He said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Staggering through the building come an old prophetess to whom the word of the Lord comes to, and also prophesied of him, blinded in eyes, but not in spirit. She knew that was the Messiah. Lord God, may our eyes come open to the fact that he's still the Messiah. And may we embrace him tonight. For we have confessed that we are pilgrims and strangers of this world. This is not our home. This is not our land. We are different acting people because we are born from above. And we who hold this promise in our heart, may we see the promise that Jesus made yeah. to this church, that we would see just prior his coming as we see the days of Noah returning, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage and the morals of the land. Then he said, as it was in the days of Sodom to the Gentiles before the fire fell, that God came down and was manifested in flesh by knowing the secrets of the hearts of the people. And he promised the same thing to return. May we have the privilege tonight, great Holy Spirit. For we humbly ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Conscious of the Spirit near us. Life, break out of the shell of the hour we're living in the time and be conscious of the Spirit of God now among us. Let us turn to the book of Judges, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse, as we read the Word. As you're turning, I might say, my thinking in choosing this chapter to read this afternoon 
at the closing of this meeting might be something brought forth which would be constructive to the church. And always I wait to see what the Holy Spirit will say in the room as it strikes me. I might jot down different scriptures and things and wonder what it will be when I get there. What will he say concerning this? And now listen closely. Just try to be just as attentive to it as you possibly can as we read. For in here, if it be the will of the Lord, I'm trying to set forth a para parallel from one to another. And listen close now. 23rd verse beginning. And when the lords of the Philistine gathered together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy and destroyed, uh, destroyed our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, for he may make a sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. And he made them sport, and they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars were upon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and they were upon the roof, about three thousand men and women, that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto God, unto the Lord, and said, O Lord, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be once advantaged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two pillars upon which the house stood, and on which he bore up, of the one and the, his right hand, and on the other his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death was more than they which he slew in his life. It was a sad sight. Must have been a hot afternoon. Sun shining down. At this great celebration. And three thousand Philistines looked down from the galleys of the stadium as the pair entered. High-honored warlords and their fine jewel ladies leaned forward to get a good look as the boy led this blind man. The halls that echoed all afternoon with drunken revelry, celebrating. Here's what hurts me celebrating the victory of their fish god, Dagon, over Jehovah's servant. What a disgrace! What a thing had happened! The man had failed. Not God had not failed. And what Jehovah must have been thinking as he looked down and see all this going on. Drunken conglomeration of women half stripped, fine jeweled and decorated and fixed up, their drunken husbands drinking and celebrating to a god, a fish god, an idol, 
that had took the victory over Jehovah's servant. The lad led the stumbling blind man to the middle of the pole, the poles where they stood, two of them holding this great big uh, slanting uh, pillars, a uh, great big hall that slanted down in this manner in two great big huge posts as I could uh, think of the setting, uh, holding the people of 3,000 uh, warlords. And the celebrity, the, the finest honored soldiers, the greatest warriors, just that the, the celebrity was invited to this because it was a celebration. And across from them was this huge image of a fish with human blood beneath it upon the altar, sacrificed uh, to this fish god, a total pagan a statue that can neither speak, hear, nor breathe. But they, they, in their ignorance, they was worshiping this God, thinking that he would give them the victory, a celebration. And then led to these posts in the floor where they could all see the, the main event was just about to take place. There had been many entertainments, maybe like they used to have uh, monkeys, and uh, they had gladiators, and why they would duel, and the gladiators would say whether the victim is on the floor should be killed or not, and um, they had to see shedding blood, and all the, the events had taken place, and now the main thing come up, the preliminaries were over. And the main event was to make fun of Jehovah, make fun of our God, all because his servant had failed him. See, he's God. That's true. But we're his servants, and we got our commission to carry out exactly the way he said to carry it out. Then we find in their drunken, uh, irreverent, condition as they were in, and now they'd all raised up because there was a great silence, perhaps a trumpet sounded, and they were going to have the main event of what they were celebrating, bringing in Jehovah's Witness, bringing him out there in the middle of the hall that they all might make fun of him and make sport out of him. Look at him, humiliated broken, a symbol of a, of a fallen church, spiritually stripped, morally broken. What an example that is of the conditions of today. Samson, this was Samson. Samson the Great. So this was him, the great mighty instrument of God. While many Philistines, I'd imagine them warlords standing there looking there, while at the very remembrance of his name, the whole country trembled. Just say Samson. That's all you had to do. Just mention the name Samson, and everyone trembled. At his name, and now look at him. And you know, it used to be that the name of the Lord Jesus had a great reverence. People highly honored it. And the ones who honored it could cast out evil spirits by it. And could make a nature obey their command through his name. But I think that Samson here, what I want to parallel it to, is a modern, local, or not local, but the, the modern conditions of the church today. It's a perfect parallel. The church has long lost its respect, not because that God has failed the church, but the church has failed God. Amen. 
It wasn't because that God had failed Samson, but Samson had failed God. Where we ought to be standing in such a condition like the church was when Ananias and Sapphira was brought before the church. But instead of that, we have long compromised with the things of the world and brought it in until today it could be called a bunch of holy rulers or, or just an ordinary other denomination, just some church. It's not, it hasn't doesn't pack the dignity that it should have. I guess as they stood there standing to their feet when the main event was taking place, and let's just take ourselves back there for a few minutes. Now imagine the Philistines, many of those great warriors standing there with their fine jewel women, their arms around them, drinking a toast to Dagon. Hail Dagon! Thou art victorious over Jehovah. We have showed them what we can do. We show this fellow who claims so much that there's nothing to him. That's almost the condition of the church today. We who have the keys of the kingdom in our hand, with every spiritual gift, that God give to man laying in the church. Long have we compromised with, with creed and so forth until we've whittled all the power of God out of it, until it becomes no more than a lodge. Like in the recent event, when a Mohammed stood by the side of our foremost evangelists, and he said, I'll bring up 30 people that's sick and afflicted, and you heal 15 of them, and I'll heal 15 of them. And I say not this against the evangelist, by no means, but the evangelist took off and left the man alone without an answer. What a a, a letdown to our God, for the Word is God, and the promise of the Word is the promise of God. These signs shall follow them that believe. And it's almost come to another challenge or another celebration when heathen gods can speak to the church, and the church stands helpless, defeated, spiritually stripped. Now, there's something that's done that. That's been the cares of the world entering into the church, and it's got it no more than any lodge. We find that I believe, I don't know what I would have done in the case, I'd have to wait to see what God said. But I believe I would have felt like the Hebrew children. Our God is able to deliver us from this. Amen. But nevertheless, we'll never bow to your image, whether he does or does not. But we lost the courage. That's what Samson had done lost its power. The church has lost the influence of its testimony, that it is a, a living, moving body of Christ. It has accepted dogmas, mixed it in with their beliefs until the Word has not the preeminence. As Jesus said to that helpless church that he come to, you have taken the commandments of God, and with your traditions, you've made them of no effect. Made the commandments of God without an effect by your traditions. To explain it away, some time ago in a school, there's a fine New York man here that come to my house, and he said to me, he is a Baptist brother, and he said to me, Brother Branham, 
I am a, a Baptist, and uh, I had him to come in and sit down, he and another brother, and we talked for at length. And after a while, he said, uh, when I was a little boy, I was called to the ministry. He said, my precious old mother washed over a washboard to send me to school and said the day that I uh, was going and received my degree of uh, Bachelor of Art, my BA degree, he said, I thought then surely Christ would be in that, but said he wasn't. He said, when I received my doctor's degree, then I thought Christ would be in that, but he wasn't. He said, and when I got my LLD, uh, Doctor of, of Literature and so forth, and said, I've got enough degrees and honorary degrees that I could plaster your wall with them, and worse Christ than all of it. He said, I'm still looking for him. So I'm going to ask you a question. says, has the teachers been wrong? I said, my brother... Jewish to begin with. I said, I am in no position as a, uh, a seventh grade education to say that the teachers are wrong. I, I, I could not say that. I, I don't feel qualified to condemn anybody. But I'll say this, that I found him and he wasn't in that. Well, and he said... I hear that you were a Baptist. I said, that is true. And he said, now, I understand that you have turned Pentecostal. I said, no, I had just received the Pentecostal blessing. See? Not the Pentecostal denomination, the Pentecostal blessing. And he said, uh, well, he said, I've, I've been to their meetings and I've seen them kick over the chairs and throw a book through the window. And he said, uh, you couldn't call that the behavior of the blessed Holy Spirit. I said, I'm still not able to judge God. And he said, well, he said, uh, would, uh, what's, what makes him do that? I said, uh, in my travel, I find two classes of people. And I said, one of them are fundamentals. Positionally, they know by the mechanics that they are to be sons and daughters in God. And I said, the next I find is the Pentecostals. They, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I said, the fundamentals positionally know where they're at, but they don't have any faith in the Word. And the Pentecostals has got a lot of faith, but don't know who they are. And I said, it's like a man that had money in a bank, but could not write a check, and one could write a check, but had no money in a bank, if you could just get them together. He said, well, what makes them act like that? I said, it's letting off the steam. I said, now, I don't think that would have to be necessary. I said, but... They're, they've got to give vent somewhere. And I said, now, if they would just take all that steam and can know how to direct it fundamentally in the Word, the big regime of God would start moving on. Amen. There is where Satan got in to make it all mechanics and no dynamics. Back all dynamics and no mechanics. See, we've got to put it together. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit, but we've got to come back with the Word to feed this machine. We can't feed it on creed. It won't burn it. Chokes up the flues. It will not burn it. It was made for the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Not just part of it, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So here we stand, a church commissioned on the last commission, the last thing that Jesus said to his church, the last commission given. 
Go ye into all the world, and make disciples of all nations. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And, and is a conjunction to tie your sentence together. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents or drink deadly things that will not harm them, if they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. So why should we have to stand in the presence of some heathen god and take a defeat? We stand again like Samson, spiritually stripped, morally broken. Our churches, what has happened, they, they used to be honorable men and women, and today you, you, it's terrible. Now let's just look a few minutes at some thoughts that passed up on them. So there stood Samson, and pardon me. Here he is again today. Again, stripped, morally, spiritually, and it's also a symbol of a fallen nation. But we're speaking of church because Samson was God's servant, supposed to be, and the church is supposed to be God's servant in the earth. Many great warriors standing there Sober up for a moment as the liquors run off of their, probably their armors and breastplates and their arms around their pretty jeweled uh, queens. As they looked out upon there and many of them looking at this sight, a little boy holding this big book of a man. No eyeballs in his sockets that had been burnt out. That's what the enemy does. The first thing when he gets a hold of you, he does like he did to Samson. He shuts your eyes off from the light of the gospel. Now he cannot see. His eyes are gone. Long has the church lost its spiritual sight. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and ever promise is true. And as they stand there now, no eyes, a ridiculous sight, a disgrace, standing beneath the fish god, a captive of the very nation that God raised him up to destroy. Now I'm going to come home just a minute. And here is our Pentecostal people that 50 years ago left that muck of denomination. God called us out to be a separated people. And we stand today, just dozens of organizations different in Pentecost, all fighting one another. The very thing that God called us out to defeat, it has defeated us. If one goes to this denomination, has a meeting, the rest of them don't want to cooperate. Just now and then you can find one. That's right. And denomination has always been a curse in the sight of God. It never was. God never did. That never was His plan. God cannot change His program. God deals with individuals. There were millions in the days of Noah, but Noah was the anointed one. There was millions in the days of Elijah, never Elisha and Elijah at the same time. On down, each generation, there were two and a half million in Egypt. Moses went down. There were millions in the days of Jesus. Even when John, the great prophet, stood, when he seen this great mighty one come on, he said, I must decrease now. My work is over. And he will increase. God, he pointed them to the Lamb. But see, that went on for 300 years until the Nicaea Council. 
And then we had to have an organization. Then from that on, that fell. And every time that a message comes forth and they organize it, it dies spiritually and never comes back again. So it's a cursed thing to the church of God for man to put his hand upon the moving of the Spirit. Always. Then they take them out there and get seminary ministers and they rub shoulders with the world and so forth. The first thing you know, they got the women acting like the world and the man. The first thing you know, politics and the bishops and want a straw in their hat and they cut and push and uh, fuss and fight until the Spirit of God is completely grieved away. Some of them remember seeing Samson when the anointing was upon him. Standing in the field with a thousand Philistines laying around him, with nothing in his hand but an old brittle jawbone of a mule that he'd beat through inch thick helmets of brass, knocking Philistines one way or the other when the Spirit of the Lord was up on him. And many of them had took refuge to the rock, and he was standing there and said, If you want some, come on out. Some of them remember just seeing that. Some of them might have whispered across and said, Do you remember in Gaza that night when it was noised abroad that our enemy was in the city and we got the army, we locked the gates, and the gates weighing maybe six or seven tons, those big brass gates where a whole four or five chariots of brass could move in. An army moving in the city. And we took the army with our spears and swords and we stood and said, Now we've got him. And when we awakened, he just walked right down through them, shoving them right and left, took the gate and pulled one off and pulled the other one off and laid it on his shoulders and walked up on the mountain and sat down. That's when the Spirit of the Lord was up on him. One day, some of them might have remembered when they seen a lion roar against him, which would have killed him in a second. If anyone knows well, how fast a lion can kill you, and with a one big blast and a roar in a split second, they kill a, a two-ton wildebeest or a buffalo with just one of them paws, break his neck like that or bite him like that, and he's gone. Don't even... Kick a hoof. Kills him so instantly. And here, this man walking along, and a lion roared, and he was helpless, not even the jawbone of a mule in his hand. But the Bible said, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Amen. And he grabbed the lion and oh, tore him apart. Amen. <laughs> Now he stands helpless, all stripped of power. It's the same thing now. The church stands the same way. Where once the church used to cast out devils, the church used to raise up the dead, the church used to do the things that Jesus did. Sin could not dwell among them. The Holy Spirit came in and condemned it. If a man done something secretly and belonged to this uh, 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 Christian group, as soon as he come in, the Holy Spirit revealed his sin. Either repented or perished. But you see, we don't have it no more. And they won't receive it no more. And when it does come, they try to call it an evil spirit. Amen. That they might receive that much more condemnation. Something has to condemn them. Notice, strip the power. What must have went through that man's mind? Once that kind of a warrior, and now a little boy has to lead him around. Why? He's blind. He can't see. He has no 
nothing to see with. God have mercy upon us. The church is so denominated and so far away till the devil has poked out the eyesight, the spiritual sight, that this is the Word of God. Not a creed, it's a Word. And God's duty bound to, to produce everything that He promised in this Bible. Amen. They say, we, we believe, uh, you have got no belief coming if it's contrary to this. The mind of Christ in you, you believe the things that Christ wrote. For this is Christ, the Word. But look at the condition, look at the parallel when we see that. What must have went through his mind? Let's see what went through his mind. We see what went through the warlord's mind of the fear that they once had just of his name. They was just scared to do anything. They just mentioned Samson, that's all, everybody was gone. But now, there he is standing, a victim under Dagon, the fish god. A Jew that despised idols was standing a victim under one. Why? Because he had failed God. Samson's standing there, no doubt. Let's, let's, let's search his mind for about three or four minutes. He must have thought of all the victories he had. There he stands, what he had done, how the Lord had blessed him, and how that he once was a great man, as long as he was in the kingdom of God, keeping the promise of God. See, he had failed and got rid of the promise. That's the same thing the church has done. Got rid of the promises. Oh, well, that's, uh, we'll write our own little catechism. This is the... This is it, the Word. Amen. Now, notice he had thought of all these victories. And then this must have went through his mind. And how that he had failed God's people. It ought to be a shame to a minister that will sit and read this Bible and then walk out before his people. The world is full of lots. The Bible said that the sins of Sodom vexed his righteous soul, but he didn't have the courage to stand up and rebuke that sin. And there's many men today, and I say this with reverence, only with, with love, but just to say truth, we may never meet again. There's a many man that reads this same Bible that we read. Sits in his office preparing his message and run up on these truths of God and have to bypass them. He'd be afraid to preach against the women cutting their hair. His organization would turn him out about them wearing immoral clothes and committing spiritual adultery. And about the man that that takes the sociable drink on Christmas and, and gets out and has a little clean American fun, tells dirty jokes, still maintains the office as deacon. Amen. They know them things are wrong, but they're as it was in the days of Lot. We're back to that sinful place again. Oh, how Samson must have We've been reminded by the Holy Spirit that how he had failed God's people and had failed God himself. Now he is a prisoner of the very thing that God raised him up and gave him power to destroy. And with love, and with, I am a member. I am in this with you, not a member of an organization, God forbid, but I, I am a member by grace in the body of Christ. Amen. I am your brother. I have no uh, selfish motives. My uh, motive to achieve anything personally, I'm only zealous for the Lord God. And I say this with, with all my heart. The very thing that you were 
called out of. You've gone back into it again. And as the Bible said, as the sow goes to her waller, and a dog returns to its vomit. And if the vomit made the dog sick in the first place, won't it make him sicker the second time? Yeah. In an organization and creeds that have got the people so bound up, and God called you out to be a free people, and you turned right back around and done the same thing. It's a greater sin. Now, they had him doing tricks to entertain them. And that's just about the way it's got. Instead of a Holy Spirit, that when someone raises up and gets arrogant, the Holy Spirit is obligated to God to shut that thing up. I've seen them pack them from the meeting, paralyzed, blind, and dumb, and even die right in the meetings and drop dead while they're trying to rebuke it. God in heaven knows that right. Many of you here have been in other meetings and witnessed the same thing. There ought to be a holy power surrounding and in the church that will make demons flee. Instead of that, it's become a laughing stock. What is it? The mechanics instead of the dynamics. Now he's doing tricks. What caused it? What was the cause of Samson's fall? He let a woman lure him away from the promise of God. That's exactly what we all know that. He had seven locks, and he was born, his birth path was to be a Nazarite, an odd fellow, to the Lord. But, you see, he let this woman lure him until she shaved his oddness off. And that's the same thing that's happened to the church. You are born a peculiar people. A holy nation, a royal priesthood. But what happened? You've let the world shave off your peculiarness until you have become one of them. You had to have a denomination just like they had. You had to outshine the Baptist or the Methodist one. And now the Simlist is trying to outshine the United and United outside the Simlist Church of God out this and oh my, on and on, 30 or 40 different organizations. See, like the dog returning to its vomit, the same thing. Notice, the same thing has been done as it was then. Let Jezebel, the mother of harlots, Revelation 17, you remember, she was called a whore. That's a, a woman that's immoral, and woman always is, uh, represents, the church is represented by woman because Christ one he's coming after is a bride. And she was the mother of harlots. What is an immoral woman? Now, it couldn't have been man because they were harlots. See? is a woman that would live untrue to her husband. And she claims that she is the mother of all churches, and she is. And what made her a whore? is because she committed spiritual fornication. She adopted creeds instead of her husband's word. Instead of becoming a rue, true mate to her husband, she took another book of creeds. And what was she? The mother of harlots that did the same thing. Uh, you don't need any more explaining to that. You see where it's at. What was it? Organization. Getting away from the Word. Notice. Now, what Delilah uh, did to Samson when she kept wooing him. Oh, you are a great man. You are powerful. But don't deceive me. Tell me wherein lieth your strength. 
And she loved him. And she made love to him until finally he gave in. And what did they do? The first thing she did, she had his secret taken from him. Well, that's the same thing that happened to you readers and Bible students at the Nicaea Council. The old path of Pentecost wanted to stay with the Word. And they adopted some pagan ideas through Constantine and them, and brought, as Ahab married Jezebel, and brought in idolatry into Israel, so did the church marry into Romanism and bring in idolatry right straight back in the church again. Now, you've got a little bunch of harlots on the same principles. And look what's taking place now. Mother is a wooing. And again, she's going to shave all your rights away from you. God help that we'll never give it up. It's this word of death. The council of churches putting themselves together and uniting in fellowship around Rome. Exactly what the Bible said it would do. 19 and 33, the Holy Spirit came one morning and told me seven things that would take place before this nation was destroyed. One of them is that. It's on old paper there at the church. Many looked at it. How that we'd go to war with Hitler. And that uh, How Germany would fortify and build a Maginot line, or the Siegfried line, I believe it was, 11 years before it was ever thought of. And how that automobiles are constantly shaped like AIDS. And how that they'd permit women to vote and in doing so they would elect the wrong president. And in this would be a woman stand up that would govern in the United States. Not actually a woman, but a church. Amen. Then I seen her with nothing but ashes. It's going to happen. Five of those things has perfectly been fulfilled. Exactly how Mussolini would rise and go to Ethiopia and fall to step, and he would be turned to the people in shame with a woman. Many, many years before it happened, perfectly on the dot. And it's never failed. And it won't fail because it's thus saith the law. And it's not contrary to these vibes. It's got to be. Now, she's making love to her daughters, wooing them right back home again. With no spiritual understanding, strip. It's an oasis for They say, oh, what a grand thing it is. Oh, my. And Pentecostal man, sitting in the council at Rome, and sending letters around that it was the most spiritual time they ever seen. How could a born-again man cut off his secret, cut off the Word, and they live by the creed? That's exactly what Delilah has done today. Cutting off the Word and you live by the creed. Now look at the defeat today from what it was be. Ministers, instead of God called ministers for our Pentecostal group, you almost have, a, have to have a doctor's degree before you can get in the pulpit. Amen. That's right. The first thing you got to have a fellowship card. And if you have, and now in our great denominations of Pentecost, before they send a missionary, they have to take him before a psychiatrist to see if he can stand the mental test. Well, that ain't Presbyterian. That's, that's Pentecost. Yeah. Now, that's right. Now, I wouldn't say that unless I could back it up. Yeah. Right. Tell me if that's the qualification of a minister. The Bible said they never went before any psychiatrist. But they waited in the city of Jerusalem until they were filled with power from all. Ah. 
Some of them could not write their name. A few days later, one passed through the gate called Beautiful, and he had never been before a psychiatrist. He never had his fellowship card. But he said, such as I have. Now, I have never seen a fellowship card produce that yet. What are we? We're stripped, embarrassed in the presence of the Holy Ghost. It certainly fulfills what the prophet said in 2 Timothy 3, to be heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Amen. Used to be wrong for our Pentecostal women to go bathing in suits and mixed bathing. It isn't no more. No, no, just like the world. All these things. Worldly. Everything that's in the world, they just brought it in. And ministers has raised up and permitted their wives to do it. And they've done all this kind of stuff. And this generation grows on. Then the next thing comes on is, oh, my. Samson stood thinking of his great victories. Let's look back and see the great early Pentecostal victories. You don't have to look come back 2,000 years ago. Just look back 50 years ago. And remember, the Roman Catholic Church was first the Pentecostal Church. And they say that the church was born, and if the Roman church was born at Nicaea, Rome, I want scripture for that. The first church to ever begin at Nicaea, Rome. The first church began in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Oh, a victim of all the eras. Oh, then when he realized where he was standing. When he realized what would happen, as I said, I may never see you again. I don't know. This may be my last message to you. I may, if, I, if the Lord permits I come back next year, we all won't be here. Some of us will be gone. And each time I must speak as if it was our last time, because it is some of us. It may be my last time. What a condition it is, an era. And if we would only stop like Samson did and think just a moment of what we are supposed to be by God's Bible, not a great big something, not a glowing keeping up with the Joneses, but a humble, reverent, spirit-filled little group of people. Not shining, glowing. Hollywood shines, the gospel glows. We want something shiny, the biggest churches we've ever had. We'd be better off if we stood down at the alley in a storeroom and had the Spirit of God back on us again. Notice. And as he stood there and realized, and his hair had begun to grow out again. But he could not be effective because he didn't have any eyes. And he cried, Lord, revenge my eyes. They put my eyes out. They're, today I might say the creeds, they sent me to a seminary. And the call that was in my heart of the living God, they punched all that out of me saying those things was for another age. Revenge my eyes. What was Samson thinking? There was a possibility. Perhaps Jehovah's full of love. He, it might be possible that he would hear me. Oh, I wish I could get Samson to wake to that tonight. There is a possibility. He's full of love, forgiving the iniquity of his people from generation to generation, showing mercies to thousands that love him and keep his commandments. There's a possibility, Samson thought, if I only get revenge in my eye, I can't see those things anymore. They don't happen. We can't see the great Holy Spirit 
and our great organizations moving like it did at the beginning. It's gone. It isn't there. It's blind. And don't know it. Jesus said it would be that way. This lady I'll see at church age. Rich. Say, I am rich in increasing goods and have need of nothing. And don't know that thou art naked, blind, miserable, and poor, and don't know it. Don't know it. Well, we had a slogan out in 1944, a million more certain organizations. And through the ministry of great men, We've had a million more what? Joiners. That's right. He knew there was a possibility. But the thing of it is today, the people don't seem to come conscious that there is a possibility. They're satisfied to go right on down the old tree and they're going. Don't do that. Believe God. Have faith in Him. Now, they say, um, oh, they, we're set tight. That's right. We clap our hands and, and everything and shout. But, you know, it's all sails and no anchor. How can you clap your hands and shout and deny the word being the truth? How can you clap your hands and shout and the Holy Spirit will walk among you and then you say, oh, it's such a laugh at thee. It's, uh, it's something that's just not worth it. We have great gatherings. Glitter. Worldly tinsel, great meetings. What do we get? More members. The Pentecostal church three years ago put more members in it and all the rest of the churches did together. That was in our Sunday visit to the Catholic paper. The Sunday visitor said they had a million converts to Catholicism in that year and said the Pentecostals had a million five hundred thousand. Yeah. Yes, sir. All kinds of scholarship. Man learned to talk in the schools and say their speeches. Intellectual. Hollywood showman. Pardon the expression. Preaching to a bunch of so-called Pentecostal grandchildren. God don't have no grandchildren. They come in. The old Pentecostal father and mother under an experience brought you in and you just come into the church and sit there. And automatically you was a Pentecostal. You don't have grandchildren. You only have sons and daughters. There's no grandchildren. You have to pay the same price and get the same Holy Ghost that they did. You've got to be a son and daughter. Not a grandson and granddaughter. He's not an old doty grandfather soft and lets his kids get by with anything, bless their little hearts. He's God, the eternal one. That's right. Sons and daughters. We still got the big book like Samson had. He stood there with all of his power. He stood there just as big as he ever was. And we stand bigger than we were, but with stripped of power. Samson still had the brawny muscles. He still had every physical bar part he had. But the Spirit of the Lord didn't come on him no more. We stand millions strong, stronger than we were. But where is the law? As the angel said back there in the days of Gideon, he said, if, where is, if there is still God, where is his miracles? Where is the things that he's supposed to do? Where is he proving himself that he's alive in the same yesterday, today, and forever? It's what we get. Notice, Samson prayed right. Samson prayed, Lord, let me die with the enemy, when he realized what has happened around him. His eyes were gone. His strength was gone. His fellowship was gone. But there's a possibility that a prayer meeting might spark it again. See? Then he prayed right. Let me die with the enemy. You must die with your enemy. That's right. You must die to the enemy that's got you in this condition. That's right. Samson was willing to pay the price to get the power of God back on him again. 
He's seen what he was raised up to do. Not be a showman, but to be a servant. To have himself so that the power of God could flow through him. We stand millions stronger than we were, but the power... Purpose? Jesus even said, as it was in the days of Noah, wherein eight souls were saved by water, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. All this you see walking on the streets, cannon fodder. That's atomic fodder, only laid in there for judgment. The rapture comes, there'll be a scarce few. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way, and but few there'll be that find it. For broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be go in there at. Not all that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter therein, but the one that doeth the will of my Father. That's the one that goes in. Not saying, Lord, and their fine prayers and, and revivals and so forth. Oh, I hear somebody say, now, wait a minute, Brother Brandon. We have revivals. Yep, that's right. That's right. We have revivals. And what do we have? It's a denomination revival. See if we get some more in the church. And we're having another great revival, too. We're taking all the churches into one. The council of churches. Getting further and further away from God's Word all the time. Uniting. How can two walk together except they be agreed? How are we going to walk with people who deny the very resurrection of Christ? How can we walk with people who said the days of miracles is past? You are a separated people by the Holy Ghost. See, the world wants today, the, 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 what the world is wanting today is mixtures. They want somebody who can walk around and, and fellowship with the world and fellowship with the people and get a lot of members and have a social organization. But when the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Paul, God is a separator, Amen. not a mixer. A separator. He knew that his backslidden strength, though there it all stood, the great regime that he ever was, he stood there. But his backslidden strength could not meet the challenge of the hour. And the church knows that too. The advances know that when that Mohammedan challenged him. Your intellectual strength doesn't meet the challenge of the hour. Because the devil is loose among us with powers that nothing can, can dare a challenge but the Spirit of Almighty God when this word is And it's going to get worse and worse, constantly worse. He knew that he was insufficient. He couldn't do it. And he knew what would happen if God answered his prayer. I wonder if we're that willing tonight. I wonder if the Pentecostal world is willing tonight to make that same uh, agreement with God. Lord God, if it knocks my denomination to pieces, if they excommunicate me from the council, I don't care if they take my fellowship card and I have to lay on my stomach and drink brace water and eat soda crackers instead of riding around in a big car with a big salary. I don't care what the price is. That system drove me away from you. Take me back again, Lord. I'll believe your word. Revenge my eyes has been put out. Let me die with it. Amen. Let me die out to my own self. I don't care what they say about me. I may be bishop. I might be this, that, that, but I don't care what they say. Bring back the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. I've been blinded long enough. Oh, church, are you willing for that? Let me die with the rest of Let my name as reverend, doctor, or whatever it be, perish. Oh, God, just give me again. Just send upon me again that glorious power that fell on the day of Pentecost that can meet the challenge of this hour in the face of communism or anything else that rises. Let me die, Lord, with them. There's a possibility, you know. You know what? On such a confession, the Philistines... They're too drunk to notice what he was doing. 
All at once when he seen there was a possibility, he turned his head up toward the sky. And the tears running out of the blinded sockets, he began to move his lips, tears falling from his eyes. They wasn't noticed him. They were too busy making fun of him. He wanted God's Word, the real living God, to come on the scene once more. He had failed him. He knew he'd failed him. But he wanted to see the living God living here to prove to that Jezebel outfit that he still was God. Oh, if it takes a starch out of you, if it makes you not act like some kind of a movie star, if you have to let your hair grow down and put on an old-fashioned dress, I don't care what it costs. Amen. I'll take the way with the Lord's disguise. Amen. Lord, let's see it again. Let's see the presence of God moving before this Jezebel. He was aware of what happened if God answered his prayer. But he was ready and in dead earnest. That's what we have to do. Get ready. Make up your mind. Set your eyes. Let your affections. Don't alter God's word to you. Alter yourself to his word. Not my will. Thine be done, Lord. Not what I think about it. It's what you said about it. That's right. What did he cry? Lord, said the little boy, put one of my hands up on this post. It's possible. Oh, my. Lead me to the post that holds this because I want to rest my hands. I'm tired. I've been made fun of long enough. Oh, my. I know, Lord, what it's going to cost, but maybe you will. There's a possibility you're full of mercy. I failed you, Lord. That ought to be the cry of the church tonight. Uh, little lad, would you put my hand up on one pillar? Yes. And my hand up on the other pillar? Yes. Is my hands placed right? Yes. They're right. And he started to pray. And he said, Lord, revenge my eyes. In other words, I've done wrong. But just once more, Lord... Once more. Oh, if that could only be the objective of the Pentecostal move tonight. I'm willing to forget about whether I'm this way or one, this two, this three, this. I'm for willing to forget about all these worldly things and everything. Just once more. Lord, once more. Take me out of this creed and this thing that I'm bound up in. Once more. Once more, let me see the appearing of Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Once more, Lord, once more. The church would scream that, though they've been blinded from these things. Blinded from their brother and his idea. Just take God's idea and you won't have to argue about it. Once more, Lord, once more. Then there stood that big book of a frame, powerless and helpless. All at once he began to feel something happening. Every fiber of his body began to fill with the power of God. Oh, if the church could only get to that again. I all the way from the preacher to the deacon to the laity, every fiber and every member of the body would be filled with the power of God. Those big brawny muscles straightened up and he crushed it together. Let me die with them, Lord. Let me die with them. You raised me up to destroy it. Now I built myself up around it. Let me destroy myself with it, my reputation and whatever it is. Let me destroy it. But I want to see the power of God again. Amen. Always when the power of God comes in, the walls that you build around you fall. Amen. Your denominational walls will crush. Amen. And God will be no one again. He's the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. Every fiber filling with the Holy Ghost, every muscle filled, every bit of his body was just filled up with the Holy Ghost. That was Samson's greatest victory. Oh, church of the living God. I'm going to omit the rest of my note to say this one thing. Why don't we? Are you ready, assemblies of God? Are you ready, United Church? Are you ready, oneness, trinity, whatever you are? Are you ready, church of God? Are you ready, all the rest of your denominations? You forget this nonsense. And the thing that you've done, look where you got people tonight, what kind of a condition they're in. Oh, God, let's break them walls there. Once more, Lord. I don't get, we're at the end of the time, folks. We ain't got much left. We better be hollering right now, crying out. Once more, Lord, once more, just this once more, at the end of the world, let your strength fill my every fiber. I'll break away from all these things. Fellowship cards and bishops and denominations and everything don't mean a thing to me. I want you, Lord, more than anyone. Let's think of it as we bow our heads just a moment. <laughs> I'm urged to do this once more, Lord. Everybody sincerely, reverently, just as reverent as you can be. Just have faith and down in your heart, say once more, Lord. Lord Jesus. Great Master of life, the Shepherd of the sheep, come forth, Lord. These people are hungry. They're thirsting. Lord, years I've wanted to see this happen. Maybe it will. Just once more, Lord. One more great move of the Spirit. One more time, Lord, and the church might receive the rapture and faith to go in. Grant it, Lord. Make known that you are with us. And we'll praise thee for it. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I know it's not many words. I know it ain't a long prayer, but he knows my objective. I mean it. Can Jesus live among us tonight? Can Jesus once more come to us and show that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever as we've been taught? Is there sick or afflicted or downcast in here that, that you know, there's no prayer cards out. We take them all last night. But believe God would raise up your hand and say, I'm in need, Brother Branham. I pray to God that he will speak to me. Raise your hands wherever it's all over. Now, here is what the grace of God. The bare record of what I've said is the truth. See, a man can say anything unless God vindicates that, then it's wrong. Now you believe, and I want you to believe me as his servant. I want you to say to God, you see, when he met me, he said, if you get the people to believe you, and then be sincere. And now, if Jesus stood here tonight, and if you were sick or needy, whatever, he could not uh, heal you. He's already did it. But Jesus and the Word is the same. He is the Word. And he said man should live by this Word, not by creed, by the Word. And he that believeth on me, not make believeth, but believeth the works that I do, shall he also. How could he perceive what was in their minds. How did he do it? 
And they thought he was reading their minds, and he told them he'd forgive them for that, but when the Holy Ghost come to do it, to speak against that would never be forgiven. Now, we've been through it right straight through the Bible and find that God, if he identified himself then as Messiah by showing that he was the prophet and the Word, because the Bible said the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, Hebrews 4, and discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. That's the reason they couldn't hide nothing from him. And the things that, that's how they know, that's how the woman at the well knew that he was Messiah. She said, sir, I perceive your prophet. We know when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us those things. That's what he'll do. He said, I'm he. She ran in and said to the people, come see a man who told me what, what I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? And they believed it. But somehow, we don't seem like the world don't want to believe it. But God, rich in mercy... It's a possibility that he might do it again. He has to identify himself like that, the Messiah. He can't do it to the Samaritans and Jews and then leave the Gentiles out. It's got to be done. So you pray. And you touch the border of his garment and to the clergy. He is a high priest now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. That is true. Hebrews 3. Now, he is the high priest. We all believe that. That can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then his life, his actions, his everything is the same. A little while, and the world, cosmos, the order, will not see me no more. They'll never see it. Remember the angel that come down in a form of a man that talked to, to Abraham, the called out elected church. He never went down in Sodom and done down there. Like those other fellows went out there and preached like Billy Graham and them today with that G-R-A-H-A-M again, like A-B-R-A-H-A-M. Each once had their messenger. They got it today. The same thing come up here to the called out church who wasn't in Babylon. And that's where that mysterious thing was done when he told Sarah, when she was in the tent behind him, what was wrong. She laughed. And he said, why did Sarah laugh, saying in her heart that these things can't be? And Abraham called her forth, and she tried to deny it. And he said, look, here's the grace. Here's, here's the possibility. God would have struck her dead right there. But he couldn't. She's part of Abraham. For our unbelief, he'd strike us dead, but he can't. We're part of Christ. Grace holds us. But he still has to keep his word. Now, you pray. I don't see a person that I really know in the building, uh, but uh, Brother Pat Tyler sitting over here on the end. I do know him. But as far as, and I think Brother Bill Dow sitting right here and his wife. Outside of that, that's the only people that I know. Brother Joseph. And if the Holy Spirit would speak to them, I'll just tell you what about it, and then I'll omit it and tell you after the service. But once more, Lord. Once more. The works that I do shall you also. Now you believe and see at that same light that you see constantly. Well, when we got through at the church ages down there in the tabernacle, about this many people, there's people sitting right here now was present. That same pillar of fire come right over by the side of the wall and draw it out those church ages the way I had them on a the blackboard. Amen. Is that right? Many of you was there. And the people fainting and everything else. Now I said, there it is now, if there's a question. They got the picture of it here in Washington, D.C., copyrighted as the only supernatural being was ever photographed. George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI, fingerprint and document, examined it when that light was there. And he said, Brother, Mr. Branham, I said it was psychology. I attended your meetings, but the mechanical eye of this camera won't catch psychology. He said the light struck the lens. Well, if that is Christ that was stricken Paul down and called him Lord, what would you have me do? The life that was in him will be reproduced in us then. See? He's here with the called out church. And may it come to pass once more, Lord, that this people may see that you still live. And you're not dead, and neither have you left your people. They are here, but, Lord, they have had their eyes punched out by an organization, a Jezebel Delilah, 
that took them from the true word to a creed. May the walls fall. Granted. Once more, Lord, as I said, there's many here I'll probably never see again. But once more, Lord, let Jesus appear among us in the form of the Holy Spirit, that he might reproduce the life in us that he was then to fulfill his word. He's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Let the sick and afflicted touch this master. You're the same one, Lord, that could tell Simon Peter when he come up among them, why your name is Simon, you're the son of Jonas. You're the same one, Father, you don't fail. Same little woman who touched his garment. The same Christ lives tonight. May it be once more, Lord, once more. For Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen. I know one movie. Reverently. Let's be down sincere and reverent. We don't hit these things haphazardly. It's a promise of God. The divine spirit of the living God promised that in his word. And that word is life and spirit. Jesus said it was. And he and the word is the same. And man lives by that word. That word lives in man. Now, as a gift, now I'm going to tell you a secret. As a leave, you've been sweet and kind. I've never exactly expressed this. I know I've public before. Brother Branham, what is that gift? It's a gift of knowing how to get William Branham out of the way. So Jesus Christ can live through a vessel. Just getting yourself out of the way. I don't know you. I don't know nothing about you, but he does. He's the one. Now have faith and believe. Say, Lord, that man doesn't know me. And yet you said a little while the world, Babylon or Sodom won't see you, but ye shall see me. You shall see me, for I will be with you all the way to the end of the world. And it hasn't come to an end yet. You'll see me. Ye shall see me, for I'll be with you even in you. You'll see me. His life reproduced in the believer. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I take every spirit in here under my control for the glory of God, that the works of God might be made known again, if he so sees fit to do it. No more than I'd said that word. I looked here in the corner and here. Can't you see that light hanging right there? Amber moving around? Or is it? In, am I in another dimension? And just imagine my spirit. There's a little woman sitting there. She's in trouble. She's suffering with a, a stomach trouble. And she's uh, had an operation for cancer. And the cancer was on the breast. They removed the cancer, little lady. Yes. That's right. So down, you'll know. I don't know you, but do you believe me to be his prophet? I said plainly tonight, I'm leaving. Amen. Do you believe it? Do you believe that we're promised that in the last days, according to Malachi 4, that would turn the hearts of the children back to the Father? Amen. Uh, Mrs. Taylor? That's your name. You can go home and Jesus Christ make you work. What do you think? You've had an operation too. Do you believe? If you do with all your heart, your operation was also cancer, tumor, in the bowels, intestinal tract. But if, now you're suffering with complications. If you'll believe, Miss Shuckwit, with all your heart, that Jesus Christ will make you well, you can have what you ask. You believe? Here, a lady back here, she's a colored lady. She's suffering with something wrong with her eyes and with her limbs, her legs. Her name is Mrs. Washington. Stand up, if you wish. You're healed. What did she touch? 
Ask what she touched. The humility of that colored woman. By the way, it struck another colored woman sitting right out here on the end. She's suffering with a heart trouble. Her name is Mrs. Harris. You believe, Mrs. Harris? Your heart trouble has left you. What did she touch? She never touched me. She's 20 yards from me. She touched the high priest. Here. Here's another woman. You turn my head. Sitting right here. She's suffering with a heart trouble, too. Mrs. Carter, stand up. Jesus Christ makes you well. Way back, a woman with an ulcerated stomach. Her name is Mrs. P A O L I. Miss Piola, stand up. Jesus Christ heals you. All right. Once more, Lord. Once more. Do you believe him? Let's stand up. Let's confess our sins and pray once more, Lord, that the Holy Ghost fall upon us. Raise up our hands. Lord God, we stand embarrassed. The world makes fun of us, Lord. Help us tonight. Let the Holy Ghost come again. Be poured out upon the people. May he come now, Lord. May every sick person be healed. Every sinner be saved. Every seeker filled. Once more, Lord. Once more. Just once more, Lord. Once more, let the Holy Ghost fall among the people. Raise up your hearts now and cry. Once more, Lord. All together. Once more, Lord. Once more. Once more.